my name is Taryn Hart, and I'm with Occupied Media, and I blog at plutocracyfiles.com. I'm Larry Michelle. I'm the president of the Economic Policy Institute, a Washington, D.C. Uh, think tank. I, I'm also the co-author of a book called The State of Working America, which documents the uh, vast increases in inequality of uh, income and wealth and the persistent problems of job quality in our country. And who is your co-author? Is that Jared Bernstein on that? Well, Jared Bernstein wrote uh, many uh, an edition uh, from 1992 through oh. 2008, another year. Uh, then Jared uh, went into the administration for a while. But okay. I've had many co-authors that people may have uh, heard of. Uh, John Schmidt, uh, Heather Boucher, uh, Heidi Shearholz, uh, Josh Bivens, um, who's now at EPI, has a, a, a written a version of the State of Working America called Failure by Design, the one we released in 2010. And, and that tells it all, that everything that's happened, all the inequalities that Occupied Wall Street talks about, nice. this is not due to nature. There's no deity involved here, uh, at least anyone I worship. It has designed its policy that's been changed since the, the 1970s and policy that's been changed at the behest of those people who have had power, have power, and wanted more power and wealth. Right. Um, well, before we, get, yeah. before, well, before we get started on kind of the economic stuff, I did want to say that we're really excited to be talking to you this week. It's the 25th anniversary of EPI. Um, so there have been some wonderful articles about EPI this week, um, and I'm forgetting where the where the first one I saw was. And then Paul Krugman cited it, and he had a lovely. Well, I'll send you the first link. It was a uh, Sunday article in the Washington Post. Yes. Where we're not used to getting such love, <laughs> and then a nice post by uh, by Paul Krugman, who we honored uh, with an award Tuesday night at our our dinner. Uh, and that was very nice to get a big shout out uh, from Paul. And we we created a great video about Paul Krugman, which you can see both on our website but also on his blog. Uh, I think it's really be really nice uh, for people to be able to watch that. Yeah, I did. I watched it, and it is great. I will link all three of those: the Washington Post article, the Paul Krugman blog post, uh, this, which had a shout out. Not just to EPI, but to you personally. And then also the video that you guys put together for Paul Krugman, which was great. Um, so, okay, you would say, and then also the last thing I will link is you had sent me a briefing paper which discusses the effects of long term unemployment, um, long term mass unemployment, which is what we're currently experiencing. And the paper kind of ends by saying, um, that you know, we, it's, it shouldn't be this way in a, in an advanced country. It doesn't need to be this way, and it really is amazing. I'll occasionally hear people say, you know, it's just amazing that this isn't considered a crisis. If you would have went back, I don't know, whatever, you know, 2006, 2007, whatever, before the Lehman crash, and told economists that you're going to have 9.1 percent unemployment for the span of years, that would have been alarming in a way that now it's just become, unfortunately, I mean, I don't, I don't hear, I hear alarm from some sectors, but not enough. Well, I, when I went up last week to an Economist uh, magazine uh, conference at Buttonwood at the south of uh, Manhattan, just a few blocks from uh, Zuccotti Park, mm -hmm. and I told them that uh, the establishment in America is, is saying to America, you're just going to have to tough this out. We've got ours. You're just going to have to tough this out. And, and let me point out a few things that we, we say in, in, in our work, that when people describe the recession as 9.1% unemployment, it's very important that people realize that that doesn't mean that 91% uh, uh, are, you know, are okay, or 88, you know, you know 9% are unemployed, 91% are okay. And let me just explain that a little bit. Uh, I think most people are familiar that there are people who are underemployed, who are working part-time, who want a full-time job, or people 
that have dropped out of the labor market. So if you include them, you have roughly 25 million people. You have about 16, 17% of the workforce. But that only describes those people who are unemployed or underemployed in a particular month. There are many people who are unemployed this month, get a job. Other people become unemployed or underemployed. If you look over the course of a year, roughly 30%, 33% of the workforce will be unemployed or underemployed at some point during the year. And if you're in a black or Hispanic community, it's more like 40% of the people will be unemployed or underemployed at some point during the year. Now, that doesn't even capture the harm due to the recession in the short term because many people who are employed are affected by the recession. They have uh, uh, less work hours. They lose fringe benefits. They lost wages. And in a poll uh, last June from the Democracy Corps, uh, 38 percent of people said that they or someone in their family had lower wages, lost benefits, or fewer work hours in the last year. And that goes with the 42% of people who said they or someone in their family had experienced unemployment. So, you know, there's a lot of people experiencing unemployment or underemployment. If it's not you yourself, it could be someone in your family, someone employed, uh, uh, you know, is also being hurt. And so there's a tremendous loss of income for many, many years. And there's a loss to society of all the goods and services that people could be producing. We are losing that, uh, and we're also doing permanent damage to our population. Um, I would focus on young people uh, in two ways. There are the young people that, that we hear about uh, in Occupied Wall Street protests that went to college or, you know, people who didn't go to college who can't get a start. Uh, they can't find a job. They certainly can't find a job that uses the skills that they've been trained to have, uh, they're far less likely to have a job with decent wages and benefits. Uh, all the people graduating from high school or college in this period of the recession are not able to get on the bottom rungs of their career ladders. And all the research shows they will be scarred for their entire lifetime. They will have less wage income over their entire lifetime than if they had graduated into a period of, of, of full employment. But secondly, I think it's uh, equally important that it's the children in school now. Now, school success has a lot to do with what happens when you're in school, but it also has a lot to do with your neighborhood, your family. When parents are unemployed, parents are stressed, where there's more poverty, when you have housing problems, when you end up living in a family which is sharing an apartment with another family, uh, you are moving schools more frequently you don't get the education success that you otherwise would. And this is particularly going to be hard on disadvantaged children. The damage that the recession is doing to disadvantaged youth is far greater, in my view, than all the positive that can come out of all the education, so-called education reforms that people talk about. So, uh, you know, when we think about jobs policy and people worry, oh, we may take on more debt, it's going to hurt our grandchildren, you know, somehow in the future they'll have debt. We are hurting our grandchildren right now, the ones trying to get a start in the labor market and, and the ones in school. So that's uh, – and, and, and to help – to basically turn your back on America and say uh, we can't do anything to do anything about jobs uh, is, is, I think, just really harmful in every which way. And, uh, you know, that is the position of many conservative economists, conservative politicians, they don't really propose to do anything to create jobs in the short run. They, whenever they talk about jobs, it's really something that may happen in, in, you know, over the course of 10 years, not about how do we create millions of jobs now. Uh, the administration has put forward an American Jobs Act, which will do a lot of good. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm critical of them um, uh, because I think they spent a year and a half, two years not really focused on this, and of course, what they're doing now um, is very unlikely to be able to um, get passed. That's not necessarily their fault, but uh, you know, that's why we call ourselves nonpartisan. Uh, we shoot at both parties. <laughs> right. So does Occupy Wall Street. Um... I, I just saying, but you know, the Democrats are now talking about jobs, and that's good. And I, I and I want to thank Occupy Wall Street. I mean. 
these demonstrations, these people that are putting their lives on the line in, in the cold, uh, subject to police attack, uh, you have changed the conversation. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, even though there's all this stuff about the super committee and we have to lower the debt and all this kind of stuff that I think is mostly besides the point of, of what people need, uh, you have called attention to, uh, the persistent jobs crisis, the fact that people's needs aren't being addressed, uh, and that, you know, not only the jobs crisis, but it's the 30 years before the jobs crisis where people weren't doing very well. Uh, there were polls in 2007, 2006, where many people thought we already were in a recession. And that's because the recoveries just don't work like they used to, where, where people are getting income growth uh, and, and doing better. The last business cycle, then I'll stop and go to another conversation. But the last business cycle, meaning when the economy shrinks and then that goes up, from 2000 to 2007, was the first one on record uh, that we had since in, since World War II, where the income of a typical working family was less at the end than it was at the beginning. So when you lost ground in the recession, you never made it up in the recovery. And, and that's primarily because the wages, the real purchasing power of wages of both college graduates and high school graduates didn't grow a dime in the recovery. So even when the economy was improving by lowering unemployment, it still didn't get to most people. And, and, and I would, as I say, I, I used to call this a broken economy, uh, but I've learned that to not say that. It's not really broken. It's only broken from the point of view of the 99%. It's actually working the way it was designed. That's not broken. That's an actual machine operating as it was designed to do. Right, right, exactly. I mean, that's exactly the point of, I think, Occupy Wall Street um, is – that this, you know, the 99%, 1% dichotomy is partially about income inequality, but it's also about um, the fact that the political system has really been captured by the 1% and that the economy now is working on behalf of the 1%. And as you say, as it's designed to work. Um, to back up just a little bit, so I, so I assume that in order – what you're saying is that in order to create jobs, which could be done if, if we had the political will to do it, that you would favor stimulus? Is that your preferred? Yeah, well, I'll, let's go over that. I mean, you know, uh, we we have a, a, a problem of a recession is that we have too many people that want to work we uh, and don't and can't find work. We now have four and a half unemployed for every job opening. We have many facilities, offices, factories that are underutilized. Uh, what that means is that you have uh, excess supply. What it means is you need more demand for goods and services. And we don't have enough demand for goods and services because um, the housing bubble, the financial bubble, people lost wealth, they pared back, they're trying to pay, debt, pay down their debts. They're not spending like they used to. When they're not spending, firms are not investing to increase their ability to produce. They can produce with what they have. Uh, when people are not spending, um, you know, we, the economy just doesn't uh, hum along. And what happens in that situation is also the government automatically runs a big deficit. When people aren't paying taxes from the wages they're earning, when companies are not paying taxes because they're not producing as much as they used to or, or as much taxes, you have less revenue. The government also spends more. It's got unemployment compensation and food stamps, Medicaid to help people get health insurance. These are things that the spending goes up in a recession and then goes down when unemployment falls. So what we have is a very large deficit that some people opportunistically, making a claim that this is some big structural thing, there is a big structural problem in the long term that has to do with how much we spend on health care and health care costs increases in the public and private sector. That's a topic for another uh, Skype interview. Right. But, um, right. You know, just... but the, we have a huge deficit, and we have a huge deficit because we have a huge recession. To get the deficit down, you actually have to create jobs. You have to get us out of this recession. So how right. do you do that? Right. Well, and it, uh, can... I, 
if I could just if I could just kind of make sure I'm following with with what you're saying. I mean, I think that people forget a lot that GDP is variable. So part of what's going on is that, you know, as is that, you know, and Paul Krugman has made this point several times that there, you know, the the there's kind of a right wing talking point that you know, the Obama administration has just been spending like crazy, when in fact what it really is is a result of the slump, partially because GDP has decreased, but then also the spending that has increased has been entirely for social services that are a result of the slump, or by and large, that's been yeah. the increase in spending to GDP ratio. And it's temporary by nature. Once we get out of the recession, that spending will disappear and in fact, that spending, if you took an economics course, would be called an automatic stabilizer. That spending, which goes up automatically, actually helps us from having even worse unemployment because, as I think people need to understand, you know, when, when people are given food stamps and they go out and buy food, then all the people who produce that food, both uh, the farmers as well as the people in the factories and the people who transport it, all have jobs. And they spend money in the economy. When you are given unemployment benefits to people who are long-term unemployed, these are people who are having a hard time getting by. They are uh, uh, not getting their health care. They are not. They are uh, tend to go bankrupt. They tend to be uh, combining households, um, shrinking their households. When they get money, they spend it. When they spend their money in the supermarket, the drugstore, on rent. They are keeping money in the economy, keeping other people employed. Right. So that leads us to what's the first thing you want to do to create jobs is one, we have a twofer. We, we, we want to provide these unemployment benefits and food stamps to people that are hurting. We want to do it both because of our compassion and to help people get through these tough times, but it's also by the Congressional Budget Office and, uh, and economists generally recognized as one of the best ways to pump spending in the economy. A second thing we can do, and we should be doing a lot of it for a lot of years, is uh, infrastructure spending. Uh, infrastructure spending on roads and bridges, on mass transit. Uh, there's bills uh, to uh, pump a lot of money into modernizing schools, replacing the heaters in schools, greening schools. Uh, this is just a great time to do all that. When you do that, I want to explain how that creates jobs. People who are doing the work obviously get the jobs. But only about a third of the jobs created are people actually in the construction sector. Hmm. When you do, you build something, you also buy cement, you buy steel, you buy inputs to keep other people employed, people trucking that material to the site. And all of those people who are doing all the work buy things throughout the rest of the economy. Uh, around 40% of the jobs are actually the benefit of uh, keeping people working who spend. So people in all sectors uh, spend. Okay, so we have the safety net expenditures, you know, infrastructure. Uh, I think another important thing was very important in the original stimulus is providing the aid to the, uh, to the, to the states and local governments. When you, you know, and that is also a twofer. We want to be able to preserve the services that these governments provide. But as we do, it also creates jobs because the, the states have people employed who spend wages in the economy. They also contract. A lot of the health care is done in nursing homes. These are the private sector. Private sector people will lose their jobs. And we estimate that half the people that will uh, keep a job or gain a job because of aid to the states are in the private sector. Okay, fourth, I think it's very important what, what we haven't done, what we really could do, is have a very large-scale government employment itself, a public sector, public service employment. We could be giving money to cities and counties and community-based organizations for people to do work to provide services. Uh, that actually is very cost-effective. It allows us to target our efforts to the communities that are most in need and that may need our help for a very long time. Like, you know, uh, communities with uh, 15, 20 percent unemployment. Uh, and, you know, we really need to do something to make sure that there's jobs there. So um, that's just, you know, the top order. Uh, what do you do about the deficit? Well, you know, in the, in the short term, you need to spend money uh, 
you know, and not and allow the deficit to rise. But after a few years, you know, you can do things to lower the deficit. And you could also do things right now like uh, implement a financial transactions tax, a bank tax. There's lots of things you could do that will take effect in two years and be permanent. You could, you could easily develop a program that over 10 years reduces the deficit while increasing the deficit a lot in the first two years if we're willing to do something like the financial transactions tax, which could bring $100, $150 billion in a year. Right. So that's a, that's a general program. And, you know, the president's program, which also includes continuing the payroll tax holiday uh, where, where, where people have less taken out of their weekly paycheck. Uh, I mean, if you're going to do a tax thing, that would, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good one to do. And I'll just say a couple of things over that. One is it doesn't really help people who exceed the uh, Social Security cap. People pay payroll taxes only on the first uh, $106,000 of their wages. So anyone who earns, you know, $500,000 is not getting the benefit between their $106,000 and the $500,000. Um, the people get the money. They are able to spend it. Um, and, and, and this money is reimbursed to the Social Security Trust Fund. This is not really going to weaken the uh, Social Security, uh, although many conservatives may try to say, let's just keep these taxes lower and not put money in Social Security. But I don't think they're going to get away with that. They shouldn't. So uh, I think it's important. There's, there's between the uh, the two, thi two things the president is pushing, the uh, renew the unemployment compensation for next year so people – excuse me, who are unemployed for more than 26 weeks are able to get un unemployment benefits and the continuation of the uh, the payroll tax holiday. Uh, if we don't continue those, we will lose 1.6 million jobs. So it's important to keep those going and do much more. Right. So, okay. I wanted to um, back up a little bit. Something I've been hearing recently uh, kind of another right wing talking point is that um, is that there's a, there are enough jobs it, they're just not necessarily good jobs so if people would be willing to take you know less you know be willing to take any job that there's enough jobs out there is that false well I think they they say two things uh, they say that and then they say that there's a lot of job openings that the employers just can't find the right people for. Uh, right. That's, well, the, that's the structural unemployment argument, right? Yeah, yeah that's what they say. Well, uh, that's a class perspective. You know, that's the perspective of people who spend their time talking to employers and not talking to people needing a job. Um, you know, whether or not there are some jobs open where people, they, they can't find the people, that is not the majority of what's going on. That's not really the issue. Uh, and I would say to those employers who can't find people, raise your damn wages. Uh, you know, people aren't uh, being trained to, to come in. You know, employers believe that they hang out a shingle and everyone should line up around the corner to take a job at whatever they offer. Well, that's not economic. The shortage is not in economics when you just say, I have a job, come work for me. You know, if you can't find people, if you start raising your wages to us, attract people from other jobs, and you can't find people, then you do have a temporary shortage. Uh, but no, that's not the issue. We have four and a half people for every job opening. We have workers of every education level. The unemployment rate has doubled between 2007 and now. Now, college graduates have an unemployment rate of, of over over 5%. I'm talking about people with a college degree, but without a further degree. And that's more than double what it was in the spring of 2007. And that's lower than the unemployment rate of other education groups. But it's quite a lot. And young workers uh, who have, um, uh, you know, a college degree uh, have a much higher unemployment rate. Excuse me to go, uh, you know, and and in the recent 12-month period, a, a recent college graduates, if you were black, 14.7% were unemployed. Hispanic, 13.5%. White, 9.2%.
So mm-hmm. even a even a, even a privileged white recent college grad, privileged in terms of racial discrimination in this country, has an unemployment rate equal to the national average. A recent college graduate. Uh, so uh, you know it can't possibly be that with all these people with every type of education that the main thing in front of us is they don't have the right skills. Uh, and, you know, when employers really want people, uh, I remember back in the late 1990s, a Wall Street Journal article talking about how employers were hiring, you know, black people with felonies, you know, on their record. When you really need people, you hire who's out there, uh, and uh, that's not what's happening now. Now, the other thing that's happening now is that corporate America – has about 20 to 30 percent more profits now than it did before the recession. That's not well known. So even though we have a very shrunken economy, 90 percent unemployment, uh, American business is doing well. Now, most of that is actually the financial sector, which is earning uh, cash hands over fists. Right. So, um, you know, that's part of the complaint. You know, how could it possibly be that these people who threw our country and the whole world into a darn economic conflagration, how could they be doing so well? And what they're doing is making profits, and then they're using those profits to fund political movements to keep things the same way. And that, you know, is something that we, we need a protest movement to, to address. <laughs> yes. Yes, we do. Um, yeah, okay, so... Yeah, the structural unemployment argument, like one of the things I've never understood about it, we watched Lehman crash and we watched unemployment go through the roof. We watched it. I don't understand. So is the argument, the structural unemployment argument, that all of a sudden at the same time a bunch of people decided to withhold their labor, decided not to work at the same time? Uh, as James Tobin, a Nobel Prize winner, once said, it's, o- it's often funny that the people decide to take a vacation at the same time as the machinery and the, and the factories decide that they want a vacation too. Why is it that that happens? Right. Now, the fact is, you, you're absolutely pointing to something very intuitive and a very strong argument. If people aren't skilled enough for the jobs, you know, people that are unemployed now but that were employed a year ago or two years ago, has the economy really changed that rapidly that – you know, now, now all of a sudden, people who were employed and productive are now not uh, needed? The answer is no. I mean, there's no evidence that we've had some big surge of investment, that we've had a big boost in productivity, a big technological transformation. You know, we do have some problems in some areas of manufacturing, which are high-tech and maybe require a lot of skills where they have trouble finding people. And uh, I feel for that, but I think that's also a reflection of our nation not taking its manufacturing sector seriously. I mean, why? You, you, it's not unreasonable that young people in high school and college don't say to themselves, God, how can I develop a career in manufacturing? Right? I mean, because you just sort of know that whatever you do, you, you know, that doesn't seem like you're going to be able to do it for your lifetime, right? right? And so, you know, the manufacturers who are the ones who are shipping jobs overseas can't also complain that they can't find people who want to be in their employ, especially people who have abandoned the idea of job security, lifetime careers with a firm. So, uh, you know, from the, from, the, from an upper 1% perspective, from the business class perspective, you know, they can't get what they want easily. Uh, and the fact is they need to do something different. They need different policies. And it's not that we have uh, dumb, unskilled workers. Right. Um, okay, so... We've been talking entirely about fiscal stimulus. Um, Mike Consul, who I seem to mention in every single interview I do, um, because he's done such a great job of kind of charting out the various uh, positions people have taken, um, et cetera. And in talking about uh, kind of remedying the short-term jobs crisis, he did a Venn diagram that I don't I don't know if you saw it, but he had he has two separate Vens. One is for the supply side, kind of crowding out folks. I call them the the Sith contingent, um, and the other is the demand side folks. And for the demand side folks, for the Ven, he has three separate areas. 
which are fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus, and debt restructuring, mortgage restructuring, in terms of dealing with the short-term jobs crisis. Where would you be on the fan? It sounds like you would favor fiscal um, stimulus. Go all, ahead. The, all three of those things. Okay. You know, we need to do the maximum we can on monetary policy. Uh, we ought to be cramming down the, uh, uh, the, the debt that the, the people with homes, I mean, the banks need to be able to take uh, big haircuts. Um, we need to get people out from under this foreclosure crisis. Um, and, uh, yeah, and the Federal Reserve Board needs to do uh, everything it can to stimulate the economy. I mean, this is a 10 alarm fire. When you have a 10 alarm fire, you bring every fire truck you have. Right. And, uh, and that's, that's what I think we have. And, you know, it's, it's, now the, 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 the building that's on fire has structural flaws. Okay, we need to address those structural flaws. But first, you know, it's a good thing to put out the fire before you can start, you right. know, changing changing the building. But we also have to work about on uh, building an economy so that when the economy is growing, uh, people are benefiting from it, and that helped get us into this recession. The lack of uh, such an economy, uh, we need to work on uh, creating that. And and then one of my other themes has been. Um, you know, we are not broke, nor will we be. Uh, there's a lot about we are not, we are, we are broke. You hear from the conservatives. Mm. Uh, now, the fact is that over the last 30 years, we have produced more than 60 percent increase in income per capita. It just hasn't gotten to the vast middle class and lower income populations. So, the people that are broke are our governments who don't have the revenue because of the recession and because of policies, and 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 the vast middle class. The bottom 99% are, are broke. But our nation is not broke. And the nation will not be broke. All the projections that people cite when they want to about the deficits in the future, the federal fiscal deficits, those very same Congressional Budget Office projections show that we will have per capita income growth of over 60% in the next 30 years. So the question before us, are we going to have a set of policies? Are we going to have a politics? that is going to lead us to shared prosperity, or are we not going to have that? That's the, to me, that's the question that occupied Wall Street people are asking. You know, we, we need to challenge the power so that we can have the policies that allow us to be better off, to allow everybody to share in the prosperity that our nation produces. Uh, and so the point is that this is not about some economic laws that, that you know, would be violated if we do what we need. Uh, because, you know, we, ha we, we have the income. The income is being generated. I don't think any of the policies that we're talking about are going to uh, limit that, that growth of that income. It could, in fact, even enhance it. So, um, you know, that's another big lie that we are broke. We, we have broke governments because of a recession, because of the bank crisis, but that doesn't mean our nation is broke. Right. Um yeah, so, okay, so I just, so you would be in the middle of that, Ben. You would support all three aggressively. Um, Absolutely. And for debt restructuring, you know, I think I hear from our movement, you mentioned cram down, which is a bankrupt, is, is in bankruptcy allowing judges to reduce the principal to market value, cram down um, the mortgage debt to yeah, market value. Oh, yeah. So that people aren't underwater is um, the term that's being used. And also, um, there's a lot of people associated with our movement that are concerned with student debt um, and would like to see, and maybe one way to deal with that is through bankruptcy. Right now, there's a hardship exemption that's, there's a, there's a hardship requirement for discharge of student loan that's very difficult to meet. And so some kind of liberalization of that. Um, but I haven't, I haven't heard as much of that. People are more concerned, I th it seems, with, well, maybe not. I mean, I guess Obama has just released something both with respect to student debt and with respect to mortgage restructuring. Right. Well, I think, I think that people want to make sure that um, everyone can get a college degree if they so choose mm -hmm. uh, and that they are not... Um, you know, indentured servants the rest of their life to the debt. Right. 
manageable in some way. Uh, you know, and some of that is, is getting worse because the colleges need to raise tuition, especially the public schools. I'm a, I'm a proud graduate of Pennsylvania State University, but, you know, we're just, tuition was pretty low when I went to school. It's not, yeah. not so low right now, and it's rapidly going up. And that's even, for, yeah, even for, at public schools. I mean, my father came out of the UC system, and I think they paid, I mean, it was almost free for residents. Right. And, and so, incredibly yeah. high quality education. Yeah, well, that's, and, and that's amazing for our democracy, for social mobility upwards. It's it's important for our nation's investment in people and our future growth. Uh, and, um, you know, we have a vast community college systems that, uh, where people are getting, uh, you know, entry and access to higher education. It's important they be able to do that. Uh, you know, I'm a big believer that everybody who wants to go to college should be able to go to college and not graduate with, uh, you know, debt that weighs them down. Uh, it's, uh, not true that everybody goes to college in the future. If we get everybody to go, then all of a sudden the jobs are going to be there for them that use those, ed that education. But, you know, there's, uh, that's fine with me. They get the education. It'll end up driving down the wages of college graduates. That may be okay, uh, as well. That's part of our inequality will be addressed, uh, that way. But it's, you know, but, but it, to me, there's lots of communities that have been excluded from good jobs because they haven't had the access to education that, that they deserve, and we need to make that available. Right. Um, Paul Krugman wrote, I don't know, some you know, at some point during the crisis uh, that, and, and you mentioned maybe, maybe this is what you were getting at when you were talking about there's some structural problems, that he – he was coming to the conclusion that our system is inherently unstable, that it could go a generation or so, but not much more. Um, so, you know, the question I have is, can we get a handle on that? Are we going to, you know, this thing, the, the system seems to be crashing more than we would like. Right. Well, I think that, you know, capitalism is, a, is, is, is unstable. It is a myth that the market just equilibrates itself uh, rapidly and easily. Uh, I think that there's uh, no excuse for the economic conflagration we're undergoing now. I mean, it, it does come from from deregulation. It comes from uh, a failure to uh, to act uh, at a sufficient uh, and sustained scale, um, and that reflects uh, you know the the needs of people who are not the unemployed. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, yeah, there, you know, I, I, you know, I think there are ways that we can make uh, a more stable system. I'm not saying that we are going to get to a place where there will never be any recessions, but, um, you know, we've had over 9% unemployment for two and a half years. There's basically, uh, you know, no reason that that had to, uh, to happen, we you know financial crises are, are are tougher to come out of. That doesn't mean that you you have to suffer them. It means you have to do more. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, right. I mean, I think Adam Posen had a good line about it, which was that you know because the if a building's if you you know do as much as you've done in the past and the building's still burning, you don't then stop. Right, you you. You want to increase it, in fact. Um, right. But we've kind of the opposite argument's been made, which is that, you know, somehow this, pro this proved the, that stimulus was ineffective or these types right. of things, unfortunately. Um, the other que So the other question that our movement is concerned with is um, what needs to be done to reform the financial sector? What kind of changes need to be made? Is Dodd-Frank enough? Um, what needs to happen? You mentioned the financial transaction tax, which has been a focus, which, you know, would, I think, do some. Another, another thing 
is separating the commercial from the investment is something that I think you hear fairly universally that hasn't been done. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, I'm, I'm going to beg off on this. I'm not as much <laughs> a banking expert as I ought to be, and, and mm. there's people uh, that can help you out on that. I mean, I think uh, I think Dodd Frank uh, did a lot, and I think that there's you know more to be done, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, and there's also a lot to be done on the political side. How to take money out of politics? Uh, right, right. That's a really, really huge issue, and you wonder whether we will ever be successful on the economic policy front unless we are first successful on the political democratization front. front. Right, yeah, that's a sense I'm getting. I've talked to a number of economists now that there's a sense that the problems are more political than economic, that, you know, there's pretty broad agreement, at least among progressive economists, about the types of things that we could do to get us out of this mess, to reform the system, these types of things. But what's really lacking is the political will. I mean, I think Paul Krugman had a VEN where you had, uh, you know, things that would help actually fix the system and what there's the political will to do and they're completely separated. <laughs> there's no overlap at all. I think it was a European, that was with respect to Europe, but the yes. same can really be said here. Yeah, I think I think that, that in some ways that, that, that is true. Uh, and, um, you know, people need to be called out on that, you know, uh, and, you know, I mean, it's not a matter of Democrats, Republicans making a compromise, you know. I mean, the Republicans, what they want to do would actually uh, hurt, hurt, would actually make unemployment higher. Right. I mean, if you actually cut government spending right now, it will, you will not only lose the jobs of those government workers, you will lose jobs throughout the economy. And it is, it is a, it's a destructive thing to do on just about every level. So, uh, you know, so making com some halfway compromise between the president's jobs plan and what the Republicans want will will lead us to the status quo. Right. We get that, that's not what it's about. So, uh, you know, we people do have to organize. Uh, people have to make sure that, um, you know, both parties – Pay the price for not doing what they what they what what, what needs to be done, or and held accountable. And you know, and, and maybe not. It's not. I'm not saying they have plague on both your houses, but you know, uh, it's only with a motivated population that we're ever going to um, see some action. And 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 again, you know, Occupy Wall Street has really changed the conversation in this country, and it really needs to keep doing that. I, I, you know, I don't believe. That you know you need your ten point you know precise agenda. I think that's really phony. I think um, uh, you know the, you know, the, but something needs to be done. And on the jobs front, I think it's really important for people to pay attention when someone says they're doing something about jobs. You want to ask if what you're saying is going to create jobs. How many more jobs are we going to have in the next year? Don't tell me about how many jobs we're going to have by 2020. So how many jobs are you going to have by the end of 2012? Because the unemployment rate at the end of 2012 right now is projected to be by the conventional wisdom at 8.5% or so and could be as high as it is now. I mean, that's 8.5% unemployment is worse than we ever got in the last two recessions at the worst moment, okay? Right. That's five years into this. Five years into this, 8.5% unemployment with some states – you know, like Michigan or Rhode Island, you know, in really deep, deep trouble, South Carolina, California. Uh, you know, there's just uh, people say that's unacceptable, which means we shouldn't accept it. Right. Right. Uh, and I, I think that that's, you know, a big impetus, obviously, behind this movement is to um, say enough and um, that it is unacceptable that, that, uh, you know, we fixed, you know, we paid all this money to, you know, public funds to recapitalize the bank and bail out the banks. And once that was done and once kind of we stopped this fall, you know, Main Street was just left to suffer, basically. Um, and, there, and, there, and there is, you know, you mentioned – 
kind of brought up the demands issue. There's been a big issue about whether we should make demands and this types of thing, and a lot of that I think is phony. But I certainly, I certainly feel that we something transform. I, you know, my hope is that there is something that's actually transformative. It's good to change the conversation, but we really need something concrete. Something really needs to change. Um, you know, we. I think we're on the brink of environmental catastrophe. I mean, we've got huge problems that need to that we need to be able to address. Um, and so, my hope is that it leads to something. You know, and and when I hear the stuff that's coming out of the super committee, I don't feel very hopeful that. No, oh, it's going the wrong direction. I let me I say one word on the the budget policy. I mean, there's absolutely no reason why we have to agreed to some long-term deficit reduction program right now. The whole idea that that's what we're debating right now uh, when we have this kind of unemployment, uh, you know, is is really, uh, it's a response to, I mean, there may be a political need at some level because the population has been told that, that these deficits are a huge problem and that we have a, a debt crisis, that we're going to be like Greece. All, all of that is not true. As I said, we have a huge deficit because we have huge unemployment. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that is, uh, Senator Harkin has a, has a good line for this. You know, there's two tracks. Many people are arguing about what the car looks like on the wrong track. You know, we need to be on a different track. Right. And, and the other track is job creation. Not, And we definitely don't need... Anybody savaging our social insurance, our, our social security, uh, our health care. The Health Care Reform Act is going to do a lot. We don't know all that it will accomplish over the next 10 years in terms of cost containment. Uh, you know, we, we can live with that. Um, you know, most of the deficit problems that you can imagine over the next 10 years are really due to one thing, and that is the Bush tax cuts. Mm. If you look at the uh, old Simpson, the President's Deficit Commission from last year, all that they recommended, and they were supposedly really tough and brave, uh, you know, with the way they savaged uh, domestic spending and other things, uh, you would get to the same result if we just repealed all of the Bush tax cuts. So all of this stuff we're hearing is really how to pay for the Bush tax cuts. Right. That's really all that it is. Right. How to Over continue the, to fund millionaires. Absolutely. Well, some of the Bush tax cuts are middle class. I, right. I don't care about that. But, you know, in, in 2001 and 2003, people were not demanding tax cuts. That was a political thing by Bush and his party really forced tax cuts on people. People didn't want tax cuts. You know, no one wants to see their taxes rise. You know, but the fact is that um, I think people want the services that the taxes do provide, and we have to um, make sure the services are good, and we have to reach out to people to talk about, uh, you know, what do you get from, um, you know, the money that you put in the system, and that people feel better if they know that it's a fair, progressive tax system. Mm -hmm. Well, do you, so this will be my last question, because we need to wrap up, but, um so you've mentioned that you think the conversation has really changed in the last month as or the last six weeks as a result of Occupy Wall Street. Um, are you more hopeful that something uh, will maybe result from that? Well, I think we, we you know, uh, you know, as an observer of Congress and all of that, you know, I, I think it has emboldened and inspired the progressives in the in, that are currently uh, in the political system, the way that people were inspired by the fight back in Wisconsin and the fight back going on right now in Ohio. Right. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, I'm not expecting big legislative changes, uh, you know, but this is, uh, you know, but what will happen is, is the conversation uh, stays on what's important, then the politics will change. And uh, I'm, I, it, it has given me uh, great hope. Uh, I mean, the dreariest time was the, the, the debate over the debt ceiling right. that went on in the summer. 
Uh, the thing that kept me going then, frankly, was uh, my baseball team was doing great, and I was uh, I became a grandfather for the first time in August. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but everything else was pretty dreary, the economy, politics, uh, and Occupied Wall Street uh, has, has, has changed the conversation, and it does give me great hope, and I, I, I want to express uh, my deep appreciation to, to all the people involved. Well, thank you, and, you know, we want to thank you, too. You know, you, the EPI and you um, have really, you know, labored on these issues kind of alone and without any reinforcements uh, of any kind for a lot of years. And so we really appreciate that that's happening. And the other thing is I really want, um, I really hope that, and, and I, I think, I think progressive think tanks, including EPI, are doing this. But I really hope that our ideas are kind of on the ready if we ever can get the political well. I get I get worried that there will, you know, I was somewhat surprised by the amount of disagreement among economists when the economy crashed. Um, you know, I was really radicalized by this whole thing. And, and what radicalized me, I mean, partially the economy crashing – kind of created a bit of an ideological crisis because I didn't know much about economics, but I knew that that wasn't supposed to happen, not supposed to be able right. to happen. But then when it did happen, I kind of thought, well, you know, we're going to get to invest in a lot of infrastructure, and it seemed really clear how to fix it, and, and, and people seemed at first to be talking in the right way about it. And But then the fact that it didn't happen, that we were completely unable to do it, and that there were these huge disagreements among economists, and even very pres prestigious economists were saying things that, you know, espousing kind of treasury view <laughs> type things that, you know, I was surprised by and disappointed by, I guess. So... Well, I'll, 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 I'll tell you this. You know, uh, we work uh, uh, very closely with the social forces that I think make up the progressive movement. These forces are not as large or as vigorous as, as we need, but the ones that are there, which are uh, the American labor movement, uh, which is a very important uh, stalwart movement for the uh, bottom 99%. Uh, the civil rights uh, organizations, networks of community-based organizations, women's groups, um, all these, you know, we do talk, we, we do incubate the policy ideas. Uh, I, uh, I don't think of it as, you know, we have the ideas and we throw them out to the movements. We, it's a matter of engagement. I think it's right. important that, that you, your movement uh, also bubble up really important uh, ideas and, and, and change the agenda. But uh, I think it is more a matter of politics than it is uh, a matter of knowing what to do about uh, policy. Uh, we, will be, we will be ready when the time is, uh, is ready to work side by side with, with you all and, and others. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I, there's a really, uh, there are great people in many, many organizations and movements and uh and and people who have been wanting to see you know asking you know when is the rebellion going to happen and so uh thank you for lighting the fire right. and we have to do right. another one of these skype interviews that focuses solely on uh income stagnation and income inequality and wealth inequality right so, and its relationship but, to the but, crash uh, with the job and all that stuff that, that's really important stuff uh, but there's, there's more, more, more to talk about. Great. Great. And uh, thank you so much for hooking me up. I've got, I'm interviewing Dean Baker and T uh, Tamara Drought. I hope I'm, pronoun I'm not pronouncing her name right. Tamara uh, Drought. Yeah, tomorrow. And so I couldn't be more excited about that. And also going to be set to talk with Josh Bivens. And so, you know, you and Jared Bernstein have been so generous in uh, helping us to get into contact with people and um, continue our series. So yeah. thank you so much, and okay. we will stay in contact. Okay, take care. All Go right, bye-bye.